Hello everyone, welcome. It's Phil in the Digital DJ Tips studio with another Thursday Q&A live. If you are joining us for the very, very first time, this is not a YouTube video, this is not a five second, here's how to fix this or how to do that. This is a magazine show, this is a live show. You're watching a recording of a program that we do every week from the studios of Digital DJ Tips, the world's leading DJ school. It's just me, Phil, the founder of the school, chatting to our audience, taking questions and sharing knowledge for an hour. So this is one of those, put the kettle on, settle down in a comfortable chair, turn your phone notifications to quiet or even better, off, uh, and settle down and chat DJ for an hour with us here at the school. As ever, I think I say, I say this every week, don't I? We've been really busy today doing all kinds of stuff and it's just nice to have a break. Uh, and uh, just chat DJing with you, our audience. So hello, welcome if you're joining us. Loads of you are indeed. So a few regulars saying hello already. Robert and Paul, Keshia, The Ruckus, You Don't Like My Music, Alan, who says, thank you for all the good tips and advice, Phil. It makes my hobby so much more interesting, helpful, and enjoyable. Oh, Alan, thank you. Our work here is done. Good night. <laughs> no, I'm only joking, but thank you, Alan. It does make it all worthwhile when we get comments like that from, uh, from our uh, community. Baldrin says, good morning, Phil, and good morning all the DJs out there. Baldrin is in Washington. He's on uh, YouTube. We're on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch as ever today. Good morning, says A.D. Foster, and hello to Carlo. Uh, hello to Gail Coker on Twitch. Right. The point here is that I'm here to help you with your questions. The moment we have the the venerable DDJ 1000 SRT set up, and that's because we're in the middle of teaching a Serato course. I've been making lessons on Serato Sampler today, uh, and uh, it's been a fiddly one, trying to teach everything you need to know about Serato Sampler and its sync and its cue points and its key lock and its advanced features and stuff has taken all day, but we've done a good job of it. We're very pleased with it. Uh, so that's a lesson. Another lesson added to our Serato course that we're making at the moment. It's, uh, it's a good one. It's coming out later this year. However, talking of courses, before we get started with your questions, uh, I've got some really exciting news, and that is that our mobile and wedding DJ mixing course, which is called Mixing for Mobile and Wedding DJs. Funny that is currently, uh, literally as of yesterday evening, uh, and only for a few days, uh, on New Year's sale. It's been our most popular mixing course ever since we launched it at the end of last year. It's our latest mixing course, and it's on New Year's sale, and that means that you can get this for 35% off, saving yourself $100. Like I say, our most popular mixing course ever. Uh, and the reason we think it's been so popular, not only with mobile and wedding DJs, but with all DJs, is that it's a course that shows you how to mix properly. So if you wanna learn quick mixing, quick mashups and edits, really fast ways of moving between tracks, great ways of combining all the music that mobile and wedding DJs play, uh, but literally just using the radio versions. Just using the versions everyone knows, using the versions that your boyfriend or your girlfriend listens to even though they're not DJs, the versions of the songs that your grandmother knows, the versions of the songs that they are singing because they're on the radio, right? So no having to join download pools, no having to find DJ edits, no having to use remixes. This is just, give me the biggest records of all time and show me how to mix them. And actually, if you think about it, what a ridiculously simple idea for a course. So I'm not surprised it's done really well. We're very proud of mixing for mobile and wedding DJs. Uh, and it's currently, as I say, on a very special and very limited um, offer where you can save $100 on it. So just head over to the Digital DJ Tips website where you can find the link for that. Uh, and then actually, this is something cool because <laughs> this is something we've been wanting to do for a long, long time and we've finally done it. Um, let me tell you the story of this. When we started Digital DJ Tips, we were a blog. It was just me, literally in 2010, blogging about the latest digital DJ gear because it really excited me. As a DJ, I'd been DJing at that point for 20 years. It was, it was an exciting thing for me. So I started blogging about it. And then slowly, we had more and more people asking for help. So we wrote our book. Some of you will know our book. 
course you will, rock the dance floor. Uh, we also made a couple of little DJ courses, which went absolutely astral. We ended up selling thousands and thousands of DJ courses. So we were always a DJ school, but actually we looked like a blog. Well, all that has changed. Literally, it changed yesterday. After 11 years in this business, our homepage actually looks like a DJ school now. <laughs> when you go to digitaldjtips.com, you don't see the blog anymore. You see the DJ school that we are. You see the description of what we do, and you see all of our courses. Uh, and so all you need to do is go and find the mixing course. It's called Mixing for Mobile and Wedding DJs. Click on it uh, and you'll save $100 when you sign up for that now. Uh, it's hilarious really when you think about it. We've only finally changed our website to look like a school. Don't worry though, the blog is still there. You just click on the blog, it's the next tab along, and there we go, there's the Digital DJ Tips blog. All there for you to continue to enjoy and the same amount of work is going in as ever to the blog. In fact, there's more work going in. We're putting more articles on here than ever before, uh, but just, uh, just that it's hidden uh, in a way behind the homepage, which is now about, it's about what we do. Weird that, isn't it? We're having a year here at Digital DJ Tips of putting our heads together and saying, what, what can we change that's obvious? We've been so busy making courses and working with Jazzy Jeff and Layback Luke and James Hype and Angelo and all our wonderful talent, uh, so busy making things that we haven't actually taken a deep breath and said, what can we change? What can we make better that we just haven't had time to do? And that's what we're gonna be doing this year. So that's, the first change is an obvious one. Make your website look like you're a DJ school. Uh, anyway, so yes, that course is on offer. Mobile uh, and wedding DJs look out, but all DJs, because honestly, it's done well with everyone. Uh, and you can just head over to the Digital DJ Tip site, click on that link and go through to get it with that saving. It's called Mixing for Mobile and Wedding DJs. Right. Let's get to your questions then. Uh, so as I say, uh, I'm here to help with anything. Uh, so we teach DJing in five big areas. Gear, the techie stuff. Music, collecting it, preparing it. Techniques, like what you do with that music on the gear. Performing, what you do when you step out from your bedroom and go into public. And marketing yourself, promoting yourself getting your name out there, getting the gigs. That's how we teach DJing, five big areas. I'll help you with any of those five, just ask questions. Um, the first question today then is from Jermaine. And Jermaine says, uh, I've been asked to DJ a small party of about 15 to 20 people. And I'm wondering, will my party speaker be powerful enough? The power is 15 watts. It's an iJoy Bash party speaker. Right, okay, so I don't know the iJoy Bash, but 15 watts isn't very loud. The general rule of thumb is five watts per person indoors and 10 watts per person out of doors. So 15 people times five uh, would be 75 watts as a minimum. That said, look, it's 15 people in a room. Put the speaker on a table, make sure it's very near the dance floor bit of the room, and it's gonna be a lot better than nothing. The good thing is that what you are doing is taking it seriously and using something that's made for this purpose. The biggest mistake DJs make is using their wonderful, lovely, near field monitor speakers that maybe cost them a few hundred uh, as DJ party speakers. And that is the best way of destroying those speakers. And you're talking to someone here who's done it and uh, found out the hard way. You should always use a small PA system or speakers that are designed to be played loud in a room with lots of people because monitor speakers, DJ monitors, production monitors are not made for that. They haven't got the, the, the grills to protect the speakers, but also they're made to be listened to just a few feet away. They're not made to fill a room. So for all those reasons, you're doing the right thing by using a speaker that is at least designed for parties, but I don't know the model, and I'd say that does sound quite quiet. Uh, so, you don't like my music's question. What do touring DJs typically do to deal with the different electrical outlets in different countries? Well, to start with, most touring DJs have a rider, and a rider will say, I want this. And then that has to be there in the club. You know, I want two CDJ 3000s or four CDJ 3000s and a minimum DJM 900 Nexus 2 mixer. So they don't have to worry about taking their gear with them. All they're really worrying about, if they happen to be laptop DJs, you know, would be taking their laptop. So I use a special adapter for my Apple power thing. You know, the Apple thing, you can pull the, the Euro plug off and put a US plug on, you can pull the US plug off and put a UK plug on and so on. So I use that and over the years I've collected all those different adapters and then personally I just use the 
computer, which I've now plugged in, to charge all my other devices. I use the USBs on the side of the computer to charge my phone and my uh, other bits and pieces because one little tip when you are charging things from your phone is that if you plug that thing into your computer, sorry, when you're charging things from your computer, and this only works for Apples, I'm not sure if this works for other, other um, Windows computers, it definitely works for Macs. So if I plug something into my computer to charge, like my phone, and then I close the computer. The computer will turn off, but the phone will carry on charging. Anything that was plugged in when you had the laptop open will carry on when you closed it. So that's something that I figured out a while ago. So that's what I do, but um, I don't know uh, about other DJs. I'm thinking about people in our crowd, James and Luke and so on. I think they do the same, you know? I think they expect the gear to be there for them. Uh, and, and laptops you can get the adapters for, um, yeah, so. That is the way I think most people do it. But uh, do let us know if you've got your own tactics for surviving, moving from country to country with your DJ gear, your laptop, whatever it is you take with you. Thanks for the question. Uh, so Scott has a question. Scott says, um, good day, Phil. My question is about audacity. Is there a final way to make your recording levels even? I can't seem to figure it out. Any advice would be appreciated. Right, okay, should we have a little lesson on Audacity? Some of you won't even know what Audacity is. So I'll get it up on my computer and then we'll have a look at it together. So Audacity is a piece of software that lets you edit audio. It's basically an, an audio editor, that's what it does. Uh, and so Audacity is designed to help you do everything from just taking the silence off the beginning and end of a, of a, you know, a file to recording whole DJ mixes, it's a recorder as well. Uh, and from that point, you can do stuff to the mixes, you can do all kinds of processing to make them sound better, et cetera, et cetera. So let's have a look at a um, typical uh, DJ mix in Audacity. Uh, and so hopefully I can show you what you can do to make it sound uh, nice. Um, so I'm looking for one I can load now and it's just downloading it for me. It's having to pull it out of the cloud. So if this broadcast goes off the air, it's because I'm suddenly using all the, um, all the internet bandwidth to do something clever uh, for you. But no, it looks like it's, uh, looks like it's all been good. Uh, so I'm loading Audacity now with my uh, mix. So imagine this is your DJ mix, here it is. Right, this one actually looks really, really good already. This is because I've already mastered it. Um, so you're seeing a waveform just in the same way, even though it says unmastered at the top, this has already been uh, given the film Morse treatment. This is actually a very low bit rate, 192. So this would have been for Mixcloud. But anyway, forget the bit rates, forget all that stuff. We're talking about making your mixes level in this software. So what we've got here is our two waveforms, our left and right stereo waveforms. And this could be a DJ mix I've recorded in Serato or whatever and uploaded it or in Tractor or in any DJ software and uploaded it to this to do some extra work on it. So here's the thing you need to make it nice and loud. You want to highlight by pressing Command and A or Control and A the whole mix and then go to Effect and Normalize. And this lets you set a peak amplitude and I would set it to anything between minus five and if you want to go really loud, minus one. So let's actually set it to minus 10. This is going to give us quite a quiet mix. So what we're going to have here is a mix where the loudest parts are about minus 10 decibels. So this is going to sound quite quiet. This, is, this could be how your mix comes in, right? So you've done a good thing. It's always a good idea to record your mixes quietly on your DJ software because you can always make them louder later, but you can't take out distortion. So if you've done the right thing and you've been in your DJ software and you've hit the record button in your, uh, in your DJ software, the record button is here in Serato, you've hit record and you've kept your level nice and you know to somewhere that's reasonable. Uh, then when you finish that recording, it appears in your recorded part of Serato here. You can drag it into Audacity, which is what we're looking at here. I'm going to turn that off because if I leave that playing, then we're going to get taken off the air because of copyright. Anyway, um, so yeah, you drag it into Audacity, which is free, by the way. This is a free editor. You can just go and Google Audacity and you'll find it. And you might load it and it looks like this, right? So this is what you, you want to make this nice and loud. So we go to Effect and then we go to Normalize and we set it to nice and loud. So again, I always set the mastermind really quite loud, maybe at minus three. Uh, zero decibels is the loudest possible. Uh, but I always like to leave a little bit of headroom there. So this is now making it nice and loud to minus three decibels is the loudest possible part of this whole mix. There we go. 
I've now got a really nice loud mix that I can upload and share with people. Now there's other things you can do inside this program, as in any wave editor or audio editor, uh, to make that sound even better. You can do something called compression, where it will make the quietest parts louder and the louder parts quieter, so overall it sounds louder, uh, which can make it sound better in cars and places where there's background noise with radio is very compressed, for instance. Uh, there's also a limiter that you can use with the compressor to get it even louder without distorting. Uh, so there's lots of other things you can do. We actually have a course that teaches this uh, called uh, Pro Mixtape Formula. And Pro Mixtape Formula it talks you all the way through how to go from literally your first idea to having a finished DJ mix that you can then share on Mixcloud and so on. So go to our homepage, digitaldjtips.com, scroll down to the specialized courses at the bottom and click Click on Pro Mixtape Formula and learn about that course there. And this course has got quite an interesting history, actually, because it's made by Steve Canueto, who is our um, tutor here at Digital DJ Tips, alongside our other tutors, of course. But Steve is one of our uh, chief tutors. He also teaches our Scratch course. And Steve's got a really um, interesting backstory because Steve came from Ministry of sound in London. Steve uh, ended up in one of the very high positions in Ministry of Sound, but in Steve's earlier part of his career there, Steve's job was to go into the studio and record the mixes that Ministry of Sound used to sell back in the CD days. Do you remember back in the CD days when you got the, min the Ministry of Sound, the annual and the Clubber's Guide and, and all that kind of thing? Well, Steve's job was one of those quiet, unspoken jobs. He was in the studio when the big name DJs came in and cobbled together the mixes they wanted to put out. Steve stayed behind and made them sound good. He re-edited the mixes when they weren't very good in the transitions and he made sure that the final result was really loud, really pumping uh, and properly, properly edited and cleaned up and then ready to fit on a 74 minute CD when they might have given him two hours of music or whatever. So Steve really knows the fast ways of going from a genuine DJ mix where you actually did it, you know, you actually made did the mix yourself, to then editing that and making it really, really good and cutting out the mistakes and all that kind of stuff. So the course was made by Steve and it's literally the way those millions selling CDs were mastered back in the day and are still done now. So that's uh, the backstory of Pro Mix Tape Formula. So if you are interested in all this stuff and he uses Audacity in that course, if you're interested in all this stuff, uh, head there and have a look at it. Uh, it's one, just one of our courses. However, if you want to save money, the course to get now is the mixing for mobile and wedding DJs course, because that's a hundred dollar saving uh, this week. So just a heads up there. Right, okay, let's go grab another question. Thank you very much for the question there, Scott. This is from Xcosa, who says, Hi, Phil, I'm looking at a set of PA speakers, Alto TS315s. What are some things to look for in a good PA speaker? Great question. So the first thing I would look for in a PA speaker is money. The more you pay, the better it is. That's just a rule. Secondly, size. There's no such thing as a loud, small speaker. It's physics. The, the bigger the speaker, the louder the speaker. So don't think that you can buy speakers that pretend that they're really, really loud when they're tiny. Physics says small speakers will not be as loud. The next thing to look for is the build quality because you want something that's going to last. They're going to get battered. You want reinforced corners and you want a good grill on the front. The next thing to look for is the overall power. Remember the wattage. So you're looking for 5 watts RMS, which means uh, the overall steady output, 5 watts RMS per person. Now don't go for peak power. Some manufacturers say, oh, our peak power is 1000 watts, but that doesn't mean anything. You know, if you're listening to a track, doof, and there's a bang, and it goes up to that power for a second and comes back down again, that's peak power. What you want is RMS. You wanna know the power that the speaker can hold constantly, because that's the real power in a speaker, and in fact, decibels noise level is the real power but we're going to go too deep if I start talking about that. So overall we're looking for RMS, 5 watts RMS per person indoors and 10 watts outdoors. So if you're looking for a 100 person venue speaker you want a minimum of 500 watts speaker. Another thing you want I would say is a minimum of a pair so overall you want that power. Uh, definitely go for speakers that are amplified in the speaker nowadays. There's very little um, of a case to have speakers with separate amplifiers for most DJs. Uh, so you want powered speakers. I would also look for putting some of your budget towards at least one subwoofer. So if you're going to get two speakers get one floor speaker and you can get poles right so you could have a speaker 
on the floor, a, a subwoofer with a pole on one of your speakers on top and the other speaker on a normal speaker stand with no subwoofer. And then later on, you could add a second subwoofer. The reason for that is that you will never want to turn that subwoofer off once you've heard it once. It just adds so much to the top speakers. And it also gives the top speakers less to do because they don't have to provide the whole frequency response. They've got help at that lower end. And dance music is about the bottom end. But I would say just don't try and beat the laws of physics. Buy something that's big enough to deliver the volume that you want. Uh, and look at, those, look at those specifications to get something that is genuinely loud enough. And you get what you pay for. There's no getting around it. We were saying it a second ago. You get what you pay for with uh, speakers. Um, so we've actually got a review of the, the new uh, Mackie Thump, uh, the latest version of the Mackie Thump speakers coming up. They're absolute beasts. I've got them in the warehouse back in the... Um, uh, back on the other location. Uh, I've got to bring them here and get them set up and test them, but they look really nice. So um, we haven't reviewed speakers for quite a long time. So look forward to that one, uh, bringing you a speaker review. Uh, right, so this one is from Steve, and I'm gonna, gonna give you an absolutely honest answer here, Steve. I'm entering a DJ competition which needs a 30 minute mix posted on Mixcloud. The brief is house tech dance uplifting. Any tips for standing out from the crowd? In my experience, and I've no idea what competition you've entered, and I've no idea who's running it. In my experience, the people who run these competitions want you to get eyeballs on your mix. If your mix gets loads of listens, you'll probably have a better chance of winning it. And I know that sounds horribly cynical, but I'm just telling it to you from where I've watched these things over the last 20 odd years. Whoever's running this competition is trying to promote whatever it is they do, and they're using your mixes to do that. And so you shouldn't be worried about that. You shouldn't be upset by that. Just play the game. Get loads of listens. Tell everyone you've done this mix. Obviously, get it sounding reasonable. Put some nice artwork on it uh, and get people's attention in the first minute and a half. So um, one of the rules that I've heard used a lot by including by, by my friend Yakov, who wrote the book Beyond Beat Mixing. Uh, or Beyond Beat Matching, actually, this book here. Great little book. You can get this for free on the Mixed in Key website. But Yakov talked to several DJs to find out the kind of rules of making DJ mixes, and it's in that book. And one of the rules was uh, start with an instrumental and then go to a vocal, but make sure the instrumental is quite short at the beginning of your set. Don't know why, they just analyze loads of mixes. So yeah, there's a few tips there, but with competitions, it's all about eyeballs. It's all about getting people to listen to the mix. In my experience, albeit slightly cynical experience. Uh, right, so um, host, uh, who's the DJ Graham? Hello, who's the DJ Graham? Who says, afternoon, Phil. Uh, I've just this second been texting my friend in Gibraltar. Now I'm watching you. How weird. Yes, we are live from lovely Gibraltar. Is it sunny in Gibraltar today? Do you know what? I never know because this bloody curtain is always closed. Let's look up there. Oh, yes. It's probably quite cold out there, but there's a lovely blue sky just as well. I've got to go for a, a speed session. I've got to go for a run afterwards. Get me shorts on. So uh, I'm hoping it's not blowing too much of an Atlantic breeze out there. Uh, so anyway, hello to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, who's the DJ Graham? Uh, and I hope your friend here in Jib is OK. Um, so uh, I lost, says Kevin. Oh, I'm sorry to hear this, Kevin. I lost all my club DJ work before Christmas and now I cannot seem to find any work or residences. It comes and goes, Kevin. I have to say this stuff comes and goes. Uh, for me, DJing is the best hobby in the world, but if you're relying on it for a living, there's a lot of decisions you have to make which might be at odds with your hobby. Most DJs who do it for a living are generally playing mobile gigs, wedding gigs, places where they are the DJ for hire, rather than if you're lucky enough to have a residency, that's great, but residencies seem to be few and far between. Uh, but anyway, Kevin, I wish you an awful lot of success in finding new residencies this year. Um, this is from LP Remix, who asks, can a YOLO box, and I've got a YOLO box here somewhere. Where's our little YOLO box gone? Here it is. Can a YOLO box, says Kevin. This is a YOLO box, I'll show it to you here. Uh, stream to multiple services uh, without a subscription. So this is a Android tablet with loads of professional inputs and outputs, USBs, HDMIs, uh, and audio. And then instead of having the usual Android stuff on it, you turn it on and it simply runs switcher software. So software that lets you uh, plug in cameras and then get them all along with audio mixed up and sent out to the internet. And it's got built in 
Facebook and Instagram and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and actually this one is especially for doing vertical video. This is a tiny one, it's called InStream, but we've got a bigger one as well. Um, but the, that's the general idea of these things. They're basically a one box streaming solution. Um, so they're really cool, we like them. Uh, but the question is, can you use this without uh, an additional subscription if you wanna to stream to multiple platforms? And the answer to that is no. Uh, these units and all streaming stuff like this is designed to stream out to one destination. You can sometimes use more than one, like if you're using OBS on a laptop, you can if you've got a powerful computer and a very fast outward internet connection, stream to say Facebook and YouTube at the same time, but it's not recommended because of the extra strain it puts on your computer and your internet. So that's why people tend to use services like Restream, like we're live on Restream at the moment, that's how this is getting to you. So if you think of Restream as, a, as one virtual destination, so we send the signal from the studio here up to them, and then they give us a control panel, I could probably show it to you. Uh, and then in the control panel, we get to turn on all the services where we want this to go live. So this is our Restream panel at the moment. There's me a few seconds ago talking to you. And we've got here um, our YouTube page, our Facebook page, our Facebook group, and our Twitch page here, and all the um, number of viewers on each one shown to us. And so this is a way of getting ourselves live uh, on more than one platform, but these are all subscription services, right? There's no such thing as a free um, service like Restream. And these people have their own one, YOLO Live they're called. Uh, they have their own one, but you have to subscribe to it. So no, there's no, no kind of way around that. Uh, that I know of anyway. And you wouldn't want to use a free service because you wouldn't get, you know, this is rock solid. This has gone wrong once in six years or something um, on us. And they immediately went, sorry, our fault. But apart from that, it's been flawless. Uh, but you pay for it, right? It's the way of the world. Um, yeah, so that's how it works. So no, I don't think you could ever get that for free. Uh, right, let's grab another um, live question. The Rucker says, my curriculum looks like your homepage. Well, that's good to know. Good to know you're learning everything. <laughs> um, so uh, let's grab another one. This is from DJ Baldwin who says, hey, I like the new layout on the site. Oh, thank you for that. A Baldwin. Um, I just bought your book yesterday. What is your view on the music license versus non-music license for DJs? Your venue should have a license. You don't need a license to DJ. If you're playing in a, a venue, you should already be licensed because they, they get the public performance license. It's slightly different in, I think, the UK, Finland and Canada have an extra license that DJs are meant to have if they do like strange stuff. Like if you wanna play records, that's fine. You buy the records, you play the records. No need for an extra license. If you wanna play CDs, that's fine. You buy the CDs, you play the CDs. But this weird license is if you buy or own CDs and you rip them and then use DJ software, you're meant to have this extra license. Or if you download stuff from Beatport and then burn it to CD and then play it on old fashioned like Pioneer CDJs, you're meant to have this extra license. It's a con, it's just basically a money grab. Uh, it's only like in three countries in the whole world. But apart from that, the general rule is that the venue has the license, the public performance license, and you don't need one. Um, right, so this is from Asta on Facebook. Hello Asta, who says, my love and respect from Greece. Hello. Um, so when are we gonna get a review of the Reloop RMX95? Uh, good question, it's an interesting new DJ um, mixer, flagship mixer from Reloop. We've actually got some pictures of it on the website, which I will get for you. Um, and when are we gonna get a review of it? The answer to that is as soon as I go and collect it from the, uh, from the post office, because it's uh, sat on the, uh, on the pile of stuff for me to collect at the moment, and then we'll get a review done as soon as we can, but it looks nice. Uh, it's basically a new flagship from Reloop that replaces, I would imagine, the Reloop RMX90, uh, but we need to go and have a look at it. Um, it's about half the price of one of these, for instance, so um, Reloop kind of specialise in making stuff that looks and feels like Pioneer gear, but it doesn't cost as much. Uh, but who knows, it might have some tricks up its sleeve that uh, make it different from that. We'll find out when we go and have a look. Um, so Asta, keep an eye out for that one. Um, Kari or Kari says, I'm looking for a good tagging software. Any suggestions? So tagging is where you uh, go into your lists of music files and you edit the artist, title, album artwork, genre, and all the other stuff. I mean, you can use your DJ software, 
The DJ software is fine for tagging. Um, I also use, uh, what do I use? I'm just trying to have a look now and try, try and remember. I've used a few of them over the years. I know there's one called MP3 tag, uh, which I've used. I maybe got it here that I can show you, which uh, is on a Mac, but uh, I found this one pretty useful. Here it is. And this lets you pull up all your music and uh, do all your edits to it and stuff. You can do bulk editing and stuff and save it back to the tracks. You see, the thing is, when you've got music tracks in your computer, you know, your Windows Explorer or your Finder on a Mac, they don't let you edit you know, normally you can edit stuff, right? So you get a load of word processor files up and you can edit them. You can like change the file name and stuff, but they don't let you edit this stuff, the artist and the title and all that. So you need a specialized program to do it. But iTunes can do it and your DJ software can do it. So I would say just use what you've got first. Uh, but if not, MP3 tag. For some reason, it's just the one I've been using recently. I don't know why, maybe it was just the one I downloaded when I quickly needed a bulk editor. That's one of the things. Bulk editing, so changing something about a load of files, is sometimes harder to do in your DJ software. And the other thing that you tend to find your DJ software won't do is, well, I know it won't do, is if you want to change the file names based upon the metadata. So let's say you've got tracks where it says artist, you know, Sigala, um, title, there's your song title, and you want your file name to be artist-title. Well, you can do that, and you can go and do that through your whole collection. Uh, and so if you're doing that kind of blanket work in your music collection, by the way, do this. Honestly, please, please don't go and do it today. It will totally wreck everything. Your music software uh, won't be able to find your records and all that stuff. So, you know, this is something you do when you're having that big once in a lifetime clear up. But anyway, if you are looking for software that does that, then you won't be able to do it with iTunes or with your DJ software, you'll need a specialized editor. I'm sure lots of you are suggesting editors now in the comments as we speak, because you always do, because you're cool like this. So I will read a few of them out when they appear uh, down at the bottom of the current comments that are going on. Uh, right, um, so this is from Lou who says, Phil, a couple of weeks back, you answered a quick moving, you answered a moving music question. Um, and it's worked perfectly, but that's good. How do I know 100% that all the music is transferred over to my new external drive? Is there a foolproof way to know? Uh, it's a good question. What I would do is go to your place that you got the music from and look at how many files are in there and then go to the place you put it in and look at how many files are in there. And if it's the same number, then it's all transferred across. Um, that would be my starting point. Um, this is from The Ruckus who said, I almost wish I had gotten your Serato course so I could see the upcoming changes, but I was already uh, adept with the software when I joined the Digital DJ Tips family. Hey, that's cool. You know, we have courses for uh, all the major DJ platforms. The only one that's missing is Virtual DJ because uh, it turns out Virtual DJ's community are very good at helping each other to learn all the ins and outs of that software. But um, we certainly uh, have found a massive need for people learning how to use Traktor and Serato and Recordbox. So we have courses that teach this stuff. So uh, again, they're on our brand new homepage. Uh, and you uh, go down to the uh, software courses, and this is our Serato course here. Serato made easy. Uh, but Serato has changed recently. It's got stems and lots of other things that weren't here when we made this course. We've kept this course up to date as much as we can, but we decided that with Serato 3.0, that we would remake literally from the bottom up the whole course, every single lesson and every single video in it. It's about twice as long now as it was originally. Uh, and this is gonna be launching a little bit later on this year. So keep an eye out for this. Uh, but the point here is, uh, if you're already an owner of this course, you get the new one for free, because that's how we rock here at Digital DJ Tips. Uh, you get the new Serato 3 Made Easy course, absolutely free. You just log in one day and there it'll be for you um, because you bought the course. We want you to have the latest one. Um, it is the best place to know how to use your software. And here's the thing about these software courses, right? People like software course, two things. One, no one reads the manual. Two, there often isn't a manual, right? So, and you go and try and find a manual for Serato. Good luck with that. Um, it's so powerful and it's so um, flexible, this software, and yet you can't read a manual for it. So, it's really important that you understand how it all works, so we thought it was important to have a course that taught that. Uh, but the second thing is, this is something that's so simple, and yet people just don't get their heads around it. 
The second thing is, there's one really fail safe way that you can improve your DJing now without touching your decks, without buying any music, without practicing any mixing, without playing any gigs. And that is just to learn how to use the software that you already own. Because honestly, and he will not mind me saying this, one of the most technically adept DJs in the world is our tutor, DJ Jazzy Jeff. And when we were working together, we showed Jeff a few things on Serato he hadn't seen before. And Jeff, if we can, if we can teach Jazzy Jeff something, trust me, we can teach you something. If you know everything that your software does, you will have a far better chance of being able to do stuff other DJs can't do. And you don't need to do anything on the decks to learn it. You just need to understand how it works. So for instance, today we were teaching about all the things you can do with the sampler. A lot of people don't know that if you're using a two deck controller, like a lot of us have a little two deck controller, right? Like this. If you're using a two deck controller, and you've got tracks on both decks and you suddenly want to scratch or use an acapella, but you've got your decks are full, so there's no way of doing it. You can take the sample, you can take the currently playing track and put it onto a sample slot and then this deck's suddenly free. A lot of people don't, <coughs> oh, excuse me, big snooze time. A lot of people don't know that. Um, and it's so simple, it's like literally one click, bang. Now you can take that off the deck and it carries on playing somewhere else. Once you know that, you're suddenly using a two deck controller like a four deck controller. And honestly, that is one of hundreds of things that people go, oh, really? So anyway, it's exciting to have software courses and uh, we've got them for Serato Tractor and Rekordbox, but we're remaking the Serato one right now. I'm literally neck deep in it. I've got, I don't know, I've done like 25 videos, I've got like 20, 20 to go or something. He's literally turning up every day and taking a deep breath and saying, what's the best way to teach, you know, MIDI mapping in Serato or HID use with Pioneer Pro DJ, whatever it is today that we're teaching. Anyway, it's coming up. So the ruckus, you never know, you might learn something, but uh, we do appreciate your, uh, we do appreciate your uh, patronage here and we appreciate you being part of the community as well. Right, let's go have another question live. Uh, this one is from someone on our Facebook group who's not asking a question, but just says, great tips as always. Uh, I watch you on YouTube normally, but it's my, it's my first time here on Facebook, so thank you for that. Right, so let's grab a question here from, um, actually it's some feedback on the PA questions. A lot of you are saying if you're playing dance music, you do want good bass. So yes, go for a subwoofer. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, right, any sign, says Simon, of a two channel reloop beat pad three? Um, no, no sign at all. We've got the Reloop Mixon 8 Pro, which looks like a real big controller, this kind of controller, uh, coming soon. Uh, but we haven't had any uh, word on uh, on one of those. But we'll let you know when, uh, when that happens, if that happens. Um, right, so uh, this is from Mark, who says, is there any software that can, oh Mark, oh I feel your pain, that can correctly beat grid tracks as most of mine are a little bit out and I've got over 400 gigabytes of tunes, Jesus Mark, uh, that I've ripped from vinyl. Right, so you've got a real issue here Mark and the reason is that when you rip something from vinyl, and by the way this piece of vinyl I've been picking up is uh, Real Wild House by Raul Orellana. Uh, it's an absolute classic piece of old school house music. What did I pay for that? £3.99 I paid for this back in the day. Uh, it's an absolute belt. I'm getting goosebumps looking at the label because I'm remembering all the wonderful times I've played this track and that label has been going around like this in front of me. Honestly, goosebumps, people. Um, so anyway, you're ripping vinyl. The problem is that you're going to get a slight wavering of the BPM because the hole might not be in the middle, the record deck you're using might not be completely locked, uh, and the recordings of vinyl tend to be very slightly off, so your beat grids will slip. And that makes them really difficult when it comes to getting them right. And you figured this out, right? So what you're asking is, is there any software that can do this for me? Now what I would recommend is that you have a play with Virtual DJ or Rekordbox. They've both got beat gridding, which can have a go at beat gridding songs where, where you can say, look, the BPM is gonna be a bit variable. 
It's only a tiny bit, but it's enough to throw the beat grids off. And you might just find that if you beat grid them in record box or virtual DJ, you get really good results. I also know that another one of the big DJ platforms is working on AI type beat gridding, which ought to be even better than those two. But I'm not at liberty to say who or when it's going to release. But what I would say is try one of those and you might just try it on like 10 songs and you might just find it gets it right every time or at least if it gets it wrong, it's easily correctable. Like, you know, it's got the first beat wrong and you could just move the grid. Uh, and so once you've done that, whatever software you're using, you can, use, uh, you can use something like DJ Conversion Utility to move all those beat grids to, to Tractor or Serato or whatever your destination software is. Um, but there is nothing uh, better than using DJ software to do this because DJ software already does it in bulk. It's just that Serato and Tractor will not get it right first time on that kind of music because they're not very good at getting it right first time. Serato's is actually very good, but you need to go and tweak it manually. Uh, and Tractor is not good for anything that wasn't digital ele electronic. It just won't get it right. So yeah, have a go with Virtual DJ and, uh, and with um, Recordbox. They've both got a variable or a flexible beat grid option that can have a go at getting that right for you. Uh, but I do feel your pain there, but 400 gigabytes, my man, how much music is that? Um, so uh, Mark also says, actually, my vinyl rips do seem a little bit low on volume, um, but it was as loud as I could recall without going into the red. Yeah, so you could, um, you know, there's, ripping vinyl is an absolute minefield. For me, if you can get the track, on digital, I would, I would buy it every time. I'd rather spend a thousand pounds or dollars buying a thousand tracks on digital than spending a thousand um, you know, individual rips with vinyl. Because A, they're gonna sound better, B, there's a thousand rips on vinyl, I've just saved myself in time. Um, but a lot of the time you can't get tracks when they are uh, old or they're from you know, independent labels that never made it onto the download stores. Um, so yes, there's lots you can do to master vinyl rips and make them sound better, Mark kind of outside the scope of this to tell you, but try normalizing at least uh, in uh, Audacity, like I showed you earlier, that might work. Uh, right, let's go and grab a few more of your uh, questions from a bit lower down now. I'm gonna try and grab some questions that have been asked more recently. Sorry if I've skipped over your question, by the way. Uh, nonetheless, please obey our rules, which are keep calm, this is DJ, it's not uh, American politics. <laughs> and ask once. Um, I don't want you to cut and paste your questions because it just clogs up all this list I see here. We do try our hardest to get them right for you. Uh, but if we don't, then let me put that back nicely. Uh, if we don't answer your question, uh, then we'll be here next week. Or if you ask on Facebook, we can try and answer them in the week underneath the Facebook uh, video. Right, okay. So uh, this is from... Benny, who says, I checked out the new connection of Serato on my Mixed Stream Pro and it works well. Uh, you can't open up subfolders, but it works pretty well so far. Which is a good thing that, let's share this news with people. So the Mixed Stream Pro is a interesting controller that's done very well for Serato now. This is actually an engine DJ controller. It's got engine embedded in it. You can just plug it in connect to your Wi-Fi and load tracks off Tidal and SoundCloud and Beatport and BeatSource and DJ immediately. No music library, no wires. Great, it's even got built-in speakers. Uh, and it's like $600, which is great value compared to other systems that have got this kind of tech in them. Uh, but now they've made it even better by making it compatible with Serato. It'll work for free with Serato uh, DJ Lite. And if you've owned Serato DJ Pro, it'll work with that as well. Uh, they've also launched a version of this called the Mix Stream Pro Plus, which adds in, I don't know how useful this is gonna be for DJs, it adds in Amazon. So you can use Amazon uh, Music Unlimited uh, as well as a streaming service. And there's only three DJ controllers, four now, no, three that do that. There's that one, the Mixstream Pro Plus, and there's the new Denon DJ SC Live 4 and 2. Uh, and they're the only controllers that work with Amazon because they've got a special little chip in them that works with Amazon's DRM um, system. Uh, to let you do that. So quite interesting that they've added that, but I think Serato is the biggest thing there. To have a controller that you can use standalone or with, or with Serato is great, or with any, it also works with Virtual DJ, by the way, with any DJ software. Um, right, so let's grab a question from, uh, this is from uh, Mac Macarius, who says, if you are starting um, from scratch, uh, and then says, do you get it? Yeah, starting from scratch, it's an old joke. Uh, what are the first things to buy? The first five things to buy. 
Um, right, so I'm not going to, um, with, with no shade of irony here, I'm going to tell you if you're starting to DJ from scratch and you're serious about it, the very first thing you should buy is this course, the Complete DJ course. And hear me out on this. Uh, you're going to make expensive mistakes if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, now, we've got a book which uh, you don't even need to buy. Right, so if you really want to just get started, the first thing to do is to get this. Uh, head to Digital DJ Tips and click the book at the top of the page, top of the website, and download your copy of this. I want you to have this for free. It's a bestseller on Amazon. You can get it as an audio book, as a Kindle book, but I want you to have it for free. Why? Because this details how to get started in DJing. That's what this book is for. We teach DJing in five areas. It's actually on page seven of this book how we do it. Gear, music, techniques, playing out, and promoting yourself. And this book covers all five areas and talks you through exactly how it's done. This will stop you making expensive mistake in the gear, region. It will help you to collect the right music. It will give you the basic techniques. It will show you how to play your first gig and then it will show you how to get more gigs. This is what you need, right? But this course is the course version of the book. This is me actually taking you through everything that's in that book. And so before you buy any gear, before you buy any software, before you start doing anything, you want to know you're doing it right this is the thing to go for. It's the best investment in your DJ you're going to make. So uh, sincerely, I would say to you, join thousands and thousands of other DJs who have taken this course. At the very least, go to the Digital DJ Tips website and look at it. You know, for the three or $400 you spend uh, buying yourself uh, help with your DJing right off, uh, you're going to save that immediately uh, by not buying a DJ controller that six months down the line you wish you hadn't bought and then it's going to pay for itself over and over and over again. Uh, so again, that's updated all the time. Whenever there's anything new, it gets added to that course. So it's like your DJ and Bible for the whole DJ career that you've got. Um, so take a look at that course seriously. Uh, I wouldn't recommend uh, anything else at this stage. If you're that unsure about where to start, you need help and that's the best place to get it. Get the book and if you like the, uh, if you like the book and you find it useful, grab the course to go with it. Right, so Metadatix, so Metadatix, says Nick, is a great Mac tag editor. Tag editor. It is indeed, that's a name I forgot, but I've used that as well. Uh, so uh, Mario says, I got my new Denon X1850, nice mixer, uh, this week. Uh, can I link it with a controller like the MCX8000? I don't think you can, no. Uh, I don't think that works. Um, it definitely links up with the SC6000 and 5000 players. We've got that mixer here, actually. This is the Denon DJ take. The Denon DJ take on the Pioneer mixer that I showed you a second ago over on our, our pro corner over there. Uh, but this is a lovely mixer, really is nice. Uh, so I hope you enjoy your mixer. But I don't think, I mean, they've both got the, the right socket on the back. They have both got the socket on the back. That means you can plug them together. But I don't know what, you, what you're going to get from that. Um, so, uh, right, so this is from Tony on Facebook. Hello, Tony. He says, Ciao, Phil. I finally managed to be online for a live. Well done, Tony. Um, anyway, what would you suggest if I'd like to make a living with time and patience uh, as a DJ? I'm not much interested in clubs or weddings, but more in cafes, cocktail bars, events like exhibition openings and so on. Which route do you recommend I follow? I'd like to build my own unique character and start studying at 55. Thank you from Tony. Right, it's a really interesting question and I, I'm gonna give you kind of like a, an answer to this. It's based on what you said. So you don't wanna play weddings, that's fine. Um, but you do wanna do events like cafes, cocktail bars, exhibition openings and so on, carving your own little niche. What I would say to you is you've got to do uh, a little bit of reality check here, Tony. Uh, you need to go, if you want to make a living from it, you need to go where the, where the money is. Uh, and there's no money in DJing in cafes and cocktail bars, unfortunately. Um, so you need to go down the corporate route. The corporate route is when you get big companies to pay for you to DJ. Now, all of a sudden, you can be doing this kind of stuff because big companies will pay for DJs to do openings of their premises, um, as you say, cocktail events where they're trying to impress people. Um, and also, once you start to get a name doing corporate style events, and also their parties, of course, once you start to get a name doing corporate style events, then you can start networking and other people will recommend you as well. So you could be doing stuff for the council when they're doing, you know, hosting dignitaries. You could be this, the, the, the DJ providing the, the cool music there and stuff like that. So you're looking for corporate gigs. And the reason there is that there's money in them. Uh, and the reason that there's money in corporate gigs uh, is, a, is a, here's a secret that if you're interested in this kind of DJing, you need to know. Normally people are trying to knock you down on price, right? 
because like let's say you're booked to do even a wedding and weddings you can normally make good money for there's a lot of other things that that couple needs to spend money on flowers and cakes and venue hire and you know dresses and you you list it all but when it comes to corporate events it's the other way around let's say that the corporate events are being booked by the company's hr department human resources department right now the hr department they're given a budget for the year for hospitality and you'll probably come under the hospitality budget and they need to spend that money because if they don't spend it next year they're going to be given less so you've got the ability to flip this whole pricing thing on its roof like literally um, and say you know uh, I do and then insert what you want to do here so let's say what you wanted to play was I'm, I'm guessing here because you know I'm just like let's say you wanted to play um, jazz funk and soul right you're going to present yourself as a jazz funk and soul dj hey sophisticated cocktail bars and all that you're going to wear a nice suit you're going to come in looking suave and sophisticated you're going to have the white dj controller and the white speakers and you're going to come in and you're going to play what you want to play it ain't cheesy it ain't wedding stuff it's what you want to do i'm guessing i'm giving you i'm making an example up here you then because you are something specialized can charge more for that because you're the only person doing that in your uh, town and the people booking a cool DJ for their cocktail bar or their jazz opening they don't know anything about music they don't know anything about all they know is that you look cool your business cards are good you're offering something a bit different it's not going to be cheesy it's not going to be common Eileen it's going to be something that's classier uh, and as long as you do a good job of that as long as your heart's in it you're going to get more bookings like that you're an older guy right you're 55 you don't want to be playing raves you want to be playing something that's what interests you so whatever it is you want to do find the audience but go corporate they've got money that they have to spend and because you're specializing you can charge more because you are unique there's no one else like you uh, that's the way i would approach it um, and i really wish you luck there tony and i'd love to know how you get on do do stay in touch with us on that one um, right so uh let's grab a video question i don't have an answer to this but because you've asked it on facebook i'll ask our facebook crew to help you uh cadillac black cadillac black says uh, since i started doing the video djing thing i've noticed that some of the old music videos i purchased from itunes do not play in serato video and virtual dj they're just blank any idea why uh, this is a minefield it could be drm but i'd say that any vjs that are watching this um, who are on facebook help cadillac black out please in the comments i'd really appreciate you doing that um so right this is from who should we grab one from now uh, this is from sarobi who says i I'm attempting to use my Bluetooth speakers uh, to run virtual DJ without wires. Um, is that even a thing? No, it's not a thing and I'll tell you why. You need the wires coming out the back of your DJ controller going to your speakers because DJ controllers are like musical instruments. You cannot have a Bluetooth guitar because when you strum it, the music will come out the speakers half a second later. It's the same with DJing gear. You cannot have DJing gear with Bluetooth because there's a gap between what you do here and what comes out of the speakers because there's no wire. So that's why no one's ever invented Bluetooth DJing gear and no one ever will because you need zero latency music. There are some expensive specialized systems that attempt to give you that. This is one, it's called Scar Pro. And you plug one of these into the back of your DJ gear here and the other one goes to your speakers. You plug this one into your speakers and it gives you a wire free link between these two units. But this isn't Bluetooth and this is expensive. And even this has got a bit of latency on it, which means a bit of delay, which means it isn't perfect. So no, you can't do it. It isn't a thing and don't try. Give up now. Trust me on that one. You'll save yourself some time. Thank you, Sarobi, for, for asking. Uh, right, so um, this is from uh, a nice long one from Kevin. Um, 
I'm going to read this out because we've got a lot of DJs who, who, who have this sentiment as well. So Kevin says, I've been a DJ since 1978 when I was in high school. I started using Technics turntables, worked my way up to the, the 1200s. I never took lessons. I learned by ear. Um, I, my style was long blends and mixes. Wasn't everyone's back in the day, Kevin. Um, it gives a nice, smooth transition from song to song. Uh, and it keeps the crowd on the floor, uh, etc., etc. Uh, I never moved up to playing CDs, uh, Serato laptops, or any of today's tech, because for me, it takes away from the true art. I have over 3,000 records, and due to the fact that vinyl is coming back, I will never give up. Listen, Kevin, the thing with DJing is, there's no right and wrong way to do it. And if you love doing long blends with vinyl, and that is the true art for you, then stick with it, my friend. No one's telling you or asking you to change. There's always going to be room for everyone. It's a very broad church. The way DJing is nowadays, you can still do that. On equipment like this, you don't press the sync button and you don't use any of the pads. And therefore, you just have two turntables and a mixer. You ignore everything else. This kind of gear doesn't have to use any of the stuff you don't want to use. And that's great but you can use all the extra stuff. The way we teach DJing here at Digital DJ Tips is first we teach what you're talking about there, Kevin. We teach you to understand how it all works, the gear itself. We teach you to get the right music. We teach you to do the stuff that anyone can do on turntables, manual beat mixing, simple blends, using EQ properly, knowing which track you're listening to, headphones queuing. And only then we start teaching you loops and cue points and key shifting and all the other stuff you can do with modern gear. You know, you can do so much today that you couldn't do with vinyl back in the day. And we certainly think it's brilliant and we'd love everyone, including you, Kevin, to come along for the ride there. Because once you see some of the mixes that are possible in courses like the one we, we started talking about today, uh, the uh, mixing for mobile and wedding DJs courses, uh, you'll understand that things have moved on. I mean, this course here has got a video at the top uh, where if you press play on this video, and by the way, you can find this on the Digital DJ Tips website, look for mixing for mobile and wedding DJs, and it's currently $100 off. Uh, if you head to this course and click play, within the first minute and a half, you will see three or four mixes uh, which are utterly impossible to do with vinyl, and which today's mobile and wedding dance floors are demanding that you do as a DJ. Because the people at weddings and the people booking DJs, mobile DJs nowadays, grew up with EDM. They grew up with festivals and big, high production DJ sets by the biggest names in the industry, by the David Getters of this world, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And those DJs know what they're doing behind the decks. And so when a wedding DJ turns up at a venue where the couple getting married are of marriage age, you know, late 20s, early 30s now, that couple are expecting you to be able to mix like what they heard when they met and when they were out partying 10 years earlier. And woe betide you if you can't because you will fall from relevance. And so we made this course to help mobile and wedding DJs to learn the skills. And the thing is, it's not hard. It just involves a slight change in the way you approach the music. It involves getting the music sorted out properly so you've got the right information with that music, the cue points, the loops in the right places, and the key, literally the musical key information. And then it involves learning half a dozen techniques to get started and a couple of dozen more. And once you've got that, you can choose to DJ the old way or you can choose to quick mix and do all the tricks that you see DJs doing today. And you can do the right thing for the right moment. And actually in that course, we finish off by saying, okay, you've learned these tricks. This is the tricks, but this is how you've always DJed. Ah, they're all, they're, they're too, too far apart. I don't, I, I don't want to start doing these there. And we teach you how to slowly incorporate them in your, in your, your style of DJing that you spent maybe decades building up. So Kevin, look, it's a wide church and I'm glad that you gave that comment. And look, you keep doing what you do, man. Enjoy it. But if you or anyone else does want to move their skills on either for curiosity or because you feel you're becoming irrelevant, do take a look at mixing for mobile and wedding DJs because it's, $100 off right now in our New Year offer, and we don't do that stuff very often. Uh, right, I'm gonna grab one final question because I've had an hour of your time. Thank you for joining us. We do try and end on time, uh, but um, uh, I'm gonna grab one question from towards the end of today's questions here to, uh, to, to close out with. Um, right, so, oh, here's a good one. Yeah, well, I'm gonna end on this warning, and this is a brilliant warning, so thank you very much for this. 
um, from our regular You Don't Like My Music. Listen out for this one, people, because this could catch you out. Um, I love this, and I've actually never thought about it in this way before. We were talking a second ago about how Bluetooth is no good for DJs because you need instant, like I do something here, I wanna hear it. In fact, there we go, we've got, we got a piece of music there. As I do that, I wanna hear it. I don't wanna hear it a second later. I wanna hear it the second I do it. That is why it's important to have a wire. But this is the trap. Some speakers, Nowadays, like I'm thinking the big JBL boom boxes and that kind of thing, with a, with a wired input that are also Bluetooth, will still have latency. They'll still have that delay, even though you've, excuse me, you've got a wire there. And you don't like my music is saying, some headphones will as well. If you get headphones which are Bluetooth, but they also come with a wire, even with the wire plugged in, you might get that delay. So make sure your headphones are DJ headphones and make sure your speakers are made for performing. Uh, and generally that means they haven't got Bluetooth at all. They've just got a wire. Thank you very much for that. Listen, people, I've got to go. I've got to go and do that scary speed session run that I've, uh, that I've had planned for today and that I told you about at the beginning. So uh, I'm going to have to leave now, get my shorts on, get out there on the streets of Gibraltar. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us today. Do take us up on that offer if you've been thinking about that course, because it's a good one. Uh, and I'll see you on Thursday, same time. Three, oh, it's Thursday, Tuesday, five days time. Uh, it's 3 p.m. London, 10 a.m. Eastern for Tuesday Tips Live. And I think next week, funnily enough, uh, we're going to be talking about software and the best software for you. So we'll look at all the major packages. I think that's what we've got planned for next week. Don't hold me to it. But if you're interested in the difference between Virtual DJ, Serato, Recordbox, Tractor, DJ Pro AI, Mix, and all the other platforms, um, then hopefully that's what we're covering next week. So come join us. Sorry if we didn't get to answer your question today, but if you asked on Facebook, we'll get to you in the week. The reason I keep saying Facebook is it's the only platform where your questions remain underneath when I press stop now and this live stream turns into a recording. It's not that I love Facebook because I don't. Um, so yeah, till then, get good, get out there, make the moments and see you next time. Bye for now.